Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. Welcome, everyone. We are the Geek Patrol, and our microphones don't have a stun setting. Today, we're joining you from Brandon Olmsted's annual St. Patrick's Day party, party featuring his signature green meatloaf, green banana pudding, and green Swiss cheese casserole. Now, I don't know if that's food coloring or you, you know, it authentic. Took, it's, uh, it literally <laughs> took me two years before I convinced people it wasn't just me cleaning out the fridge. Okay. <laughs> hey. Well, you can do both, you know, well, entertain I will let, and... Uh, I will let everybody know that all of my food coloring comes from chemicals that Alan Gilbreth has given me. Yeah, okay. So you know they're going to taste good. <laughs> and the uh, stomach <laughs> pump is over there in the next room, so... Max is in control of that. Anyway, welcome to uh, Geek Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Brandon Olmstead and Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And uh, coming up shortly, we're going to have another special guest dropping in. It's actually more of an update. It's, uh, mm. I don't know if she slept in, in a while, but... Uh, I you think know. it's Does a anybody? wellness check. Yeah. yeah. There so we go. We're going to hear about that. We're going to get updated on Mid-South Con because next week, all things... Uh, mm. It's All on. things cooperating with technology, we'll be there. We'll be there at uh, Mid-South Con, and I hope we'll be broadcasting from oh, there. I hope so. That's the plan. Yeah. Um, uh, Brandon, you were at the WWE SmackDown. I don't know if we're <laughs> how much we're going to discuss that, but I oh, just thought it's at least mentioning you saw yeah, The Rock Dude, I got to see The Rock. Uh, uh, that was the end of The Rock's Memphis tour for uh, Friday because he actually started off by going to promote his new skincare line <laughs> at the Wolf Chase uh, Target. Oh, gosh, what was that like? Uh, I mean, it must have been insane. Well, they didn't announce it, so nobody was expecting him, but, you know, people all of a sudden were posting pictures. So as a uh, as a WWE fan and um, a Target fan, because, you know, they carry a lot of the collectibles yeah. I pick up, I am really upset that I was sleeping at the time he was there. Wow. Well, I, I will give him this. He does have very nice skin. He does. The guy doesn't age. So, <laughs> I'm I mean, just it makes saying. Sense. I, mean, I mean, I don't, I don't want to get weird, but he is a very attractive man. I would say this, too. If you're a big fan of The Rock and you live here in the Mid-South, if you want to just anticipate how you might, you know, scout him out and, and uh, stalk him, I bet you if you were to go to Graceland, you would probably see him well, making an appearance because he's a big Elvis and fan. And that's too. one of the things he mentioned uh, at SmackDown Friday night was the fact that He's, he's a huge fan of the Blues. He's a huge fan of Elvis Presley. But the truth of the matter is, is he started off as uh, Flex Cabana <laughs> here in Memphis Wrestling on yep. Channel 5 News. Yes, he did. You know, their, their Saturday morning wrestling back in the day with Jerry Lawler and everybody. That's how he started. Isn't that something? So he dev, have, you know, could we ever get him to the Memphis comic and fantasy game? No, well, I don't um, think we could afford him. No, I think he's I, outside I, our budget. If I hit the Powerball this week, I could maybe <laughs> get him for a Sunday. Well, <laughs> speaking of that, uh, we want to just say we we've we've secured our dates. You know, we we mentioned last week that mm. we'll announce. So the dates. This is a little later than normal, but I feel like the way it's playing out is very interesting. So this this year. The Memphis Comic and Fantasy Convention, it returns to the Holiday Inn over at the University of Memphis, November 23rd and 24th. We have something special planned for the 22nd that we can't announce right now. Yeah, we so, can't talk about anything um, just yet. However, um, uh, Brandon, I it's it's right before Thanksgiving. And right. There's a lot of people that are actually really stoked about well, that. If you I, were, we haven't gone this late if, before. Yes, so. we have. We've actually, well, okay, Thanksgiving technically seemed to show up a little earlier last year uh, or last time that we did this but there was only one other time that we were one week out and it was probably oh john delancey 2015 it, it was and that's and, right and though there were some uh technical issues with personalities that year <laughs> it was a very well attended convention because that's people true. saw that as your last chance to get mm. all your favorite geek toys and everything before the big holiday sales where you were going to if you wanted to try and find something you were going to have to fight half of memphis to get it yeah, and you're not competing with as many other shows around the country and everything, so I feel like this might be yeah. a, a really strategic and great, great date for us. So, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and that's just that's just one more thing where you know we're gearing up for con season. We're going to be at Mid South Con next weekend. Uh, I think you and Alan are, you know, uh, we're going to head over to Tupelo. Y'all are doing yeah. the Tupelo Con, uh, and lo and behold, we have just partnered up with the guys over at Bat Cave Treasures and Toys. For their con, their the inaugural Beyond Con, which is coming May fourth. Okay, yeah, and uh, we have the opportunity to give away tickets. You know, Rodney Shiflett over there is probably one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. 
and he and he wants to expand the geek community as much as he can. Right. So he, you know, he was like, "Hey, Brandon, do you want to give away some tickets on the air?" And I was like, "Absolutely." So we are doing a thing called Bat Cave Trivia, where we will ask you a question, not about things that are in his store, but things that show up in the actual Bat Cave, you know, in the Batman universe. And our first question is this weekend. So here we go. When are we giving the question? uh, We are going to give the question now. Okay, do it. All right. So the question for this first set of tickets is, during what criminal caper did the Dark Knight acquire his animatronic T-Rex Fido? Now, there are two different, you know, there are two very close answers. One is Golden Age and one is post-crisis. I'm looking for the post-crisis story. And the first person to text in with the correct answer will win two tickets to Beyond Con on May 4th. Okay. All right. And give the text number. Okay. So the it's, text number is... Well, I can give it out. Well, go it's ahead. 901-921-7105. You know 901-921-7105. Nine two one seven one zero five. So text your answer there. I guess you can text as many answers as you want. Well, but right. uh, we're talking comics, folks. We're Don't talking, go trying we to are look talking up comic a books Batman there. episode of you know Adam West yep. or anything. We're talking and when, strictly comics. You know, so when we have our when we have our winner, we will announce it on the Geek Tank Radio Facebook page. And then if you don't win this week, you'll get a chance to win next week. Because for the next five weeks, we will be hitting you with Batcave trivia. Okay. And not to bury the lead, which this should, maybe this should have been the way we kicked off the show. Later in the show, we have lots of bonus content. This is going to be a, a lots of extended content on this week's episode of Geek Tank Radio. Among other things, we interviewed our good buddy, Dave Dasmalchin, star of uh, Late Night with the Devil. He's so on this show with us. He's coming up and... Uh, so stay, you know, well, I should say stay tuned uh, or to get our podcast. It's going to be there. Also, Max and I did a really interesting interview with a, a film director, Patrick Reynolds. He's got a new documentary that just dropped all about the life uh, and the work of Phil Hendry, uh, a radio legend. He's just a it really it was a really in-depth and great discussion. So this week is going to be some serious bonus content on Geek Tank Radio. I can't wait to talk to David. This is exciting. So uh, so we got a lot coming up. And uh, shortly, we're going to visit with our good friend Denise from Mid-South Con and get a Mid-South Con update. You are listening to Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. There's a reason Blue Milk has an expiration date, people. The Geek Patrol is back. And yet it's still on your table for St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Just oh. add a little yellow, that's, and it's uh, the perfect serving for That's for not Brandon. blue milk. Okay. Does blue Sorry. milk turn white? I've asked this before. Does it turn white when it goes rotten? I don't know. No, no. It, we need this it, just, it just gets chunky, just like regular mm, milk. Excellent. Happy breakfast, everybody. Mm-hmm. And welcome back to uh, Geek Tank Radio. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Brandon Olmstead and Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And uh, jumping on with us is uh, Denise Hager, who is uh, looking sleep deprived and uh, <laughs> and uh, really, you know, worn out. Uh, she's a, we're a week out for Mid South Con uh, coming up, no, uh, March twenty second through twenty fourth. So Denise, uh, it's good to have you here. Well, hi. Um, okay, get like, her some caffeine. You know, yeah, I was like, if I can get an IV of caffeine, that'd be great. I should talk to Starbucks about that. I wonder if that's a thing. They they oh. they, they do yeah. I think they do injections. So thank thank you, Joe. I was like, you didn't describe me as zombie like, so I think I'm doing good. (laughs) Hey, uh, I want that's next weekend. Yeah. Hey, I just (laughs) want to say something, uh, Alan, because we we threw a lot at everybody at the opening segment, and uh, we've got a lot of bonus content uh, coming up. We've got a a special celebrity guest interview uh, with Dave Dasmalchin, and also a second interview with uh, Patrick Reynolds, who's a, a Hollywood film director. And Alan, what's the best place for people to go, or where's the best place for people to go to check out all of this bonus well, our, content? Our biggest podcast provider is YouTube, and the easiest place to get an aggregation of all of our shows is geetankradio.com. Yeah, that's if you Google it, that's the place to that's go. The, the home page has everything, and it, that that's what I oh, suggest. Yeah. Go there. So, okay, so we wanted to get that out there because this week is a, a is a must listen. Uh, it's a episode, big week. So. It's a big week, gang. Okay. I don't know. I think next weekend is going to be your big week, but I'm biased. <laughs> I'm not true. wrong. Uh, well, because you, know, the... you guys will be with us. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm going to say, Denise, that I'm very excited about the fact that you were able to stay awake while we took care of some business because uh, that proves that you still at least have, you know, 30% of your energy left. I'm functionally 
cognitively functional, functionally that, that, cognitive. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, it's fun. So Denise here in the mid South, we're always, we, we talk about this a lot. We're always proud of the fact that for the most part, we pretty much most conventions here in the mid South cooperate. We work together. We try to promote each other and uh, you know, with, uh, I would say most of us do that. Yeah. But uh, every, one, so, every, yeah. every so often there's an outlier. But you know, I was like, what, you can almost tell the ones that just don't get it and won't make it if they don't, you know, get right. on board. But as a result of that, and especially doing Geek Tank Radio, what's fun about that is we know all of the convention organizers and you can almost read the expert, you know, you can almost <laughs> see the, what's going on. Like I start, do you ever get to the point like this where you're like, I'm never doing this again. Every Why do I do this? single year <laughs> although i think i, I feel hit your pain it, um yeah. around thanksgiving of this year and then was like no we're not doing this this year i got this i'm lying to myself but <laughs> it's a labor of love it is i love this stuff and you have you know. to or otherwise you'll you'll go nuts if you i don't know why i mean it is it's so much more work than people really understand i think you know i really gotta say jim butcher i it was like book eight or something wrote about Molly was at a con and they were collecting her from a oh, con. Yeah. Uh, proving and, guilty. Yeah. And the, one of the things they were talking about is how underappreciated and how much, you know, con uh, organizers do yeah. oh, in the yeah. name of their passion, their love. It really is true. Like we love this stuff so much so that I'm a gamer who doesn't game at con sometimes, but it's completely worth it. Actually, that's not true. Between 12 and 4 a.m., I get a lot of gaming in. <laughs> <laughs> but as a result, I think conventions, you know, because I always feel like the the people, okay, there's people here, they go to every convention. They know the the geek community in the Mid-South. We appreciate you. We're not necessarily talking to you right now. The people we're talking to are the ones that are on the fence of like, oh, I don't know if I want to go to a convention or not. But I'm telling you, it is yeah. the most unique experience and you talked about passion and energy that creates an event that is really second to none. And it, it's just, it's, it's definitely worth seeing. You got to go. So. All right. It's my turn to actually do a call to action. Uh -oh. Do it. The part of Joe's going to be played by Alan for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> no. If you look in your wardrobe and you have got superhero t-shirts, you have got geek memorabilia. The biggest thing is, and I see people all the time walking around with insert, you know, uh, brand X here, right. T-shirts, ball caps and other such. Right. Jackets, expensive clothing, not just the cheap stuff. And guys, if you've, if you've owned this stuff, you need to go to a convention. Show it off. It just yeah. end of story. Go to the source. Go meet these people. And the biggest thing I will ever, the biggest experience, and I got to thank our buddy Dean Zachary for this. Okay. Of working with a medical community, a number of people there not able to go to a convention were fans. Yeah. And I want you to know that man showed up, came through, and you want to talk about making fans that were diehard Dean Zachary fans for the entire rest of their lives. This is the kind of stuff that happens because of conventions. Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's a you, unique you, culture. I mean, you, you get to meet celebrities, you get to meet artists, you get to meet people in the biz, and you might want to be in the biz. So, with that said, Denise, too, I bet you two days after the convention's over, after you've caught your breath, you're probably like, okay, this is what we're doing next year. Like, you I'm, get this I'm, new I'm, energy, right? Generally, Sunday afternoon. It doesn't even wait. Like, in the last. <laughs> Several cons. Yeah, I was like, Friday, Thursday, Friday, I'm like, no. There's a Sunday weird afternoon. psychosis with people yeah. like us. I get very excited <laughs> about is. all the things I could do next year, and mm. I start planning. I, I, I just want to go ahead and inject this in here. Uh, at ShadowCon this past year, me and Denise have already put together panels for this coming MCFC in November. I'm excited. And, and you know, that she's going to be running. You know, yeah. We, we, a Nero Spicy panel, the community you know, con, can't say condom panel, that'd be wrong, oh. but <laughs> fandom. We, yeah, keep we, it we family friendly, people. Denise. No, no, we, we're on yeah. 98.1 The Max. Everybody knows what you're talking I'm about. I'm talking about our convention. Right. Oh, no, right. Um, no, no, no. Fandom, no. I, just it's combining she, words. She okay. wanted to say con, uh, you know, as in convention kingdom, 
Oh, but you okay. know, fandom is where we go with it for um, yeah. for Obvious listeners reasons. for yeah. for new listeners. Okay, but uh, so so we got Denise in here, and um, you know Mid South Con is right around the corner, March twenty second through twenty fourth. It's at the R- Whispering Woods in Olive Branch, uh, Mississippi, right across the state line. So we're going to talk about what's going to be happening next week when we come back here on Geek Tank Radio. You're listening to Geek Tank Radio on ninety eight one The Max. The Geek Patrol is back. Drop the robot. I don't. What if it breaks? I mean, <laughs> uh, not all of them are as durable as the uh, the next one. So anyway, I do love robots. They're pretty, they're pretty cool. <laughs> and welcome back to uh, Geek Chittle. Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Brandon Olmstead and Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass and uh, our good buddy Denise Hager, director. Uh, she just does a lot for Mid South Con. Just she. If you see Denise, go ask her to do something when you get to Mid South Con. Mm, if she, you see Denise and she, you're going to ask her to do something, at least hand her something from Starbucks. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Mid South Con is coming up next weekend. It's one of our favorite times of the year, March 22nd through 24th. It is a fully immersive. Oh, I should give the at the Whispering Woods in Olive Branch. It just uh, yeah, we're if you're here in the Mid South. Just go to Hacks Cross Road and head south and uh, look to your left when you get past into uh, Mississippi. It's And what's nice about the Whispering Woods location is it's it's pretty peaceful over there and there's lots of places to eat nearby, which yeah. is always helpful. So There's a Waffle House right in front of it. They're going to get so oh. slammed. It's going to be crazy. I hope you've prepared them for what's about to descend on I them. get to see I a mean. cosplay <gasps> fight in a Waffle House? That would be 3 a.m. Oh. Yeah. Well, no sheep, I don't think. I think the Hundred Acre Woods days are gone. <laughs> Wait, a twenty-four hour Waffle House? Yeah, oh, they're about to get. They better stop. They, they're staff about to up. set a record. Yeah, <laughs> knowing my luck, it'll happen while I'm at uh, La Calisto on Saturday night. Mm. Um, so Denise, there's lots happening at Mid South Con. This is a fully immersive. You have, I mean, over a hundred hours of panels. You've got gaming. You know, yeah. There's two. There's over two hundred hours of panels and oh, almost wow. hundred and fifty hours of gaming scheduled <sighs> this year. So, and I actually think we're slightly lighter. Like, I'm sad about that. But considering we had that year off, which was, you know, a thing, you know, I think it's pretty good. Um, I do. And I'm really, really hopeful that we're just going to, you know, bounce right back. But I don't think that's wishful thinking. I think that's, you know, just my superpowers coming into play. Uh, Uh, You're you're manifesting it. Yeah. People are eager to. I mean, distract a girl would be me distracting to myself and others. What am I doing? What are you doing? Where? You know, but. Right. Um. I got I got a question because we're always encouraging new people to go to the convention. I feel like one of the things you should definitely do when you walk in is grab a program schedule, right? I mean, yes, and ask questions. Don't just be shy, you know. And one thing you'll find if you're new to conventions is they are really just about the friendliest people you're going to meet. Highly intelligent too. You can get into some really interesting conversations, but don't make the mistake of of I don't know shortchanging yourself there's a lot to do at a convention that's why people are there for three days yeah. solid get that program book and actually read it like skim through it at the very least because otherwise you'll be going man i wish i had known about that thing so i could figure out how to be in four places at once right <laughs> right that it, that is the biggest regret of uh of a convention is that you know making that having to make that decision do i go to the doctor who uh you know in in modern times uh panel or do i go to the one where they teach me how to create my own dragon universe right right or do i go to the charity auction the auction is not to be missed either is there going to be an auction yes this year? there will be an auction right after the banquet so i want to say it starts at seven on saturday okay you and and really if if nothing else a convention is just a one-of-a-kind shopping experience that's what we always showcase i think the vendors hall and you know honestly joe i think you might be biased not that we don't have an amazing set of vendors and the vendors hall is going to be very very cool but um you started as a vendor so i don't know i started as a vendor because i love the energy of a vendor room i mean and it's like i mean it really is the heartbeat of a convention i think and and it's neat to meet an artist that is making their you know you you get to buy a -a one-of-a-kind piece of art and you know meet the artist that made it that's pretty cool and i'm going to be biased here and tell you that gaming is the heart of the convention at least for our conventions you okay, know. you're probably true because that's uh, 24 hours a day. All right, I think yeah. Denise is right about that. I mean, yeah. I'm, I mean I, I'd mean, i call you both out, but then uh, the truth is is that 
I love it all. Yeah, I was like, the panels are so cool. Like, there's so many good ones this year. And our guest of honors, I'm super excited about our guest of honors. Okay, talk to us. So, I was like, just to go through, like, we have the loonies who, yeah, if you have ever played the game Flux okay. or Pyramids, oh, yeah. they're the designers of it. Like, she's all the business details and he's all everything else oh, Andy's, you know what i mean Andy's, Andy's goofy. so much yeah he's, he's goofy he's all get out but you'll learn so much from and him i've yeah. had such fun emails going back and forth between them but the last time they were here i had the flu like wednesday before con and even though i'd or help organize i didn't get to be there and meet them and that really hurt my feelings so oh wow um but yeah um i'm not they're doing in, an andy versus everybody panel and he's doing it like kind of like that old chess master setup you can come and challenge up to any of his games Oh, and neat. he will play against you. And if you beat him, there's going to be a prize reward or something. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Cool. Yep. You know, but most likely. Um, there is Cherie Renee Thomas, who is the local editor of magazine of fantasy and um, science fiction. Um, and she's done poetry and um, she has a very, she's doing a ring shout panel. So literally like, you know, the audience calls out and we're just having a conversation. But she does, she is the graphic, um, she did the graphic novel on Black Panther recently. And that was oh, her big. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And like, she's really excited about it. And I, we're excited about it. Um, there is the Blodchek brothers who are artists out of Nashville. Paul won just like <coughs> one of the biggest awards like ever for a independent artist um, and stuff. And Melissa Gay is coming back with him and, you know. Like our Nashville artists are coming together and that's really nice. But they do Aridani Studios, which is the, you know, like elf ears and the fantasy prosthetics and mm -hmm. um they're so much fun. And yeah, they've done costume so many artists, things. They're so. costume artists, but right. if you've ever seen their pen work or any of their ink drawings, they're very cool. But along with that, Mike created a role play game called Sagaborn. Yeah, they these guys are geeks through and through. Yeah. I mean, and and their booth is definitely worth a visit because there's so many different things you can buy from them so. and then there's our author guest of honor she um, elizabeth bear if you haven't read elizabeth bear read elizabeth bear she's not for me at least like a super quick read but her stuff is fascinating awesome and it just like you know her epic fantasy the suns change depending on the political or the universe they're in Awesome. So uh, Mid-South Con coming up uh, March 22nd through 24th next week at the Whispering Woods Hotel. It's in Olive Branch. Like we said, just get on Hacks Crossroad and head south. And we'll be there uh, if technology cooperates. We'll be broadcasting from there. I always say that, Brandon, because yeah, you never know. Because you never know. But uh, anyway, hopefully technology will cooperate and we'll come right back here on Geek Tank Radio. You're listening to Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. The Geek Patrol is back. And it's not out of the question that you might have a very minor case of serious brain damage. I it, it, I don't even think there's a question about that. So it, the question is, how do you use it? How do you harness mm -hmm. that um, that new dynamic? Mm -hmm. Anyway, welcome to, <laughs> welcome back to uh, Geek Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Brandon Olmstead and Alan Gilbreth and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And uh, I wouldn't say brain damage, but our brain dead friend Denise Hager. I am who not is, uh, brain dead. Stop. <laughs> hey, you're perfectly entitled. You've hey. been you're 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 a convention organizer for Mid South Con, and you're a week out. If you I'm weren't entitled brain dead, to be brain dead, you're exactly. Not doing well, thank your job. you. So, You've earned it. Yeah. Sleep deprived. But People you, need to know how much we suffer for this. You know. But you have inspired me with the various things we've said, both on air and off. We are going to like contact our local Starbucks about you know. Providing convention IVs. I think that's a thing. Like it needs Starbucks to be. If it's are you not, listening? You know, you know I'm yeah. going to come. I just need to come and bother each one until some manager agrees. Right. Um, and also, yeah. Brandon, I feel like we really want to, you know, make sure we. I don't know that we played this up enough, or if we gave all the proper information. We gave a lot of information today. Uh, we're doing a trivia contest with our friends over at Beyond Con. They yep. uh, they run. Uh, the now it's Beyond Con. Right, right, this guy right. is a hardcore Batman fan. Okay, so it's let's keep it. Batcave Treasures and Toys, right? And over in the, Bartlett, Beyond the Batcave podcast, they are running Beyond Con, and 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 there's a lot there's a lot of bees there. 
It's coming up May 4th. It's May, a tongue twister, you know. May 4th, uh, 2024 the at the... It's the. I got the address here. It's the Christian Life Center at 1879 North Germantown Parkway in Cordova. It should be pretty easy to find. Uh, and if you go into uh, the Bat Cave uh, in, in Bartlett... He, uh, Rodney is not shy about, uh, talking about this. He's oh, a really nice guy. Very, it's a really good experience uh, dropping in his shop. So. It, it was, I will say that it, it was, it was a little, um, it, it felt familiar the first time I walked into it. Mm -hmm. it. It's like you, you feel like you've been there before. Yeah. And then of course, you know, Rodney's, uh, he's at, you know, he's from Chicago. Yeah. And he's a Kiss Chicagoan. fan and a Batman <laughs> fan. And, um. And a Cubs fan. He's a Cubs fan. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I don't know. He may have reminded me of somebody. <laughs> yeah. But but really And cool even dude. with all of those shortcomings, he's a He's, he's a really a good, good guy. Dude. He's and still he, decent. You know, all right. So, so, we can go with that. So do you want to give the trivia question I, I one more time in case somebody I, missed I, it? I will go ahead and give you the trivia question again. Uh, I am looking I am looking for the post-crisis answer, and I need to know what criminal caper mm -hmm. did the Dark Knight you know, at, at what criminal caper did the Dark Knight acquire his animatronic T-Rex Fido? Yeah, sometimes if you see pictures of the Batcave, you see a giant there's a penny giant or you see a giant T-Rex and you see things like no. that. Well, there's and, a re you know. And I will tell you that, you know, over the coming weeks, Batcave trivia will be about things that are easily seen in the Batcave, most predominantly in the comic books. And if you know the answer to that, then you text 901-921-7105, 901-921-7105 with the correct answer. Give your name. Don't give one of these texts where it's like you just give the answer. Yeah. No information. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you're difficult, I might move along to the next person. So That's true. Sorry. I mean, we, we are looking for the first correct answer, but part of that correct answer is your information as well. Yeah, so do that. And one nice thing, you know, like we said, we were showcasing this, and Denise, we're, we're teasing you a little bit, but one thing we are very proud of, not all cities are like this, but the geek community in uh, Mid-South is very united, uh, and including our friends over at the Batcave. They they strategically s schedule this May 4th. It's nicely placed in between Mid-South Con and, and, uh, yeah. and, and uh, Anime Blues. That's what you do. I mean, you, if you want to, uh, you know, work together, schedule your events apart from each other that way we can all promote each other yeah. you know even with little events we do we try to double check our schedules against yeah you yeah. know uh, what you guys might be doing or meetings or whatever but memphis has such a good geek community like you wouldn't know it but you got it you almost get here and then it's like a, a really nice surprise that oh yeah it's i great. wish we had you know certain other things here um i wish we had a little bit more of like a chicago punk scene for example oh well, you know what I mean? oh yeah but that's yeah. maybe that's me I'm, i don't know um, but at the same time i think denise the is geek trying community. to i think denise is trying to figure out what we plan to do on the 22nd oh yeah but yeah no so, but it's lips true. are sealed yeah but it's true that's what we appreciate and, and, and like i said for the most part everybody in this in the town works together so hey but uh we we gotta uh, let you know there is a, this is really an epic episode of geek tank radio because coming up we are uh we let's just say we, we pre-recorded this so oh, we yeah. but we've got a really interesting conversation with uh with a guy who we consider a friend dave dasmalchin he we've watched him he he was our guest of honor in 2018 at the memphis comic and fantasy convention and we've been following his career with great interest but this new project especially late night with the devil coming out march 22nd yeah. wow yeah, it coming out the first cool. day of Mid South Con, so you can like take a break and listen. Well, we're yeah. hoping we get a Thursday release where we could watch, yeah. you know, watch it preview night, then go to Mid South Con. And and we do want to go ahead and let you know to keep an eye on your Malco uh, app because we have been informed that tickets do go on sale on Wednesday. Oh yeah, actually, we've been in contact with the folks at Malco. They've been very nice about uh, updating us, and you should be seeing news for. Uh, the uh, schedule and what theaters uh, late night with the devil will be playing. Uh, and also I want to let you know, uh, there's a second, because you're going to look at the podcast this week and go, wow, this is really long. Well, we talked for, psh, Max, you and I talked for about 50 minutes to uh, Patrick Reynolds, the director of the new documentary film, Hendry, all about the work of Phil Hendry, a radio legend. And Max, I was you very had a pleasantly time. surprised with who he and I's favorite character is on the yeah. Phil Hendry show. If you're if you're at all familiar with Phil Hendry and some of the characters he's created, you would be shocked to know who Max's favorite character is. But you and can, Patrick's and Patrick's uh, stay tuned. And Bill Hader's turns out Bill Hader's favorite. Uh, there's a lot of heavy hitters in this movie that are 
big fans of Phil Hendry. So that's coming up. So we uh, what a what a what an epic week for it's, D-Tank. It's right. been awesome. Yeah. So, but but Denise, we really mm-hmm. hope you uh, stay. You know, uh, get some sleep, eat healthy. <laughs> Take care of yourself because we need you next weekend. I was like, I'm, you know, nothing but multivitamins. It'll be good. Good. Yeah. You yeah. know how that is. Now you can get sick after the convention. Right. I mean, that always happens. I'm Alan- going to try not to either, but con crud is a real thing. Oh, Alan- it is. Alan yeah. can make you the greatest chicken soup you've ever had. So before we get true. out of here. No pressure. One but more time. I'm holding you to that. One okay. more time. Uh, Mid-South Con, March 22nd through 23rd at the Whispering. 24th. Or, 24th. I'm sorry. 24th. At the Whispering Woods Hotel in Olive Branch, just go to Hacks Cross Road and head south. We got to get out of here. We got to head south, you guys. So until next week, we are the Geek Patrol, and I am Joe Thorderson. I'm Ellen Gilberth. I'm Maximilian. I'm Denise Hager. And I'm Brandon Olmstead. Just tired already from all the excitement we've had this week. I'm worn out. You're listening to Geek Tank Radio on 98 One The Max. The Geek Patrol is back. Also, they told me you guys look like dorks. They look like dorks. I'm gonna for you. Intellectual debate is what we're all about here, Max. And welcome back to Geek Tank Radio, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Thorderson here with uh, our buddy Max over there behind the glass. The rest of the guys skedaddled out of here. They couldn't handle this. But, they look uh, like dorks. They, they, yeah, exactly. So, hey, but we are really excited about our special guest. We have Patrick Reynolds on the phone, Max. Uh, he's a filmmaker, documentarian, and he is uh, on March 15th uh, was the release of Hendry. H-E-N-D-R-I-E, all about Phil Hendry, who is a comic legend. Really, uh, I don't know anybody that even holds a candle to him in, in terms of radio. But, Patrick, how you doing today, man? I am doing fantastic. And yourself? Oh, great, man. Thanks for jumping in. So you're on the West Coast. You're out in L.A., right? I'm in Los Angeles, yes. Well, Patrick, uh, for those, you know, I hate to do this, because I, I, but I'm sure there's people out there maybe that have never heard of Phil Hendry, even though in my mind he is really, he should be in the Hall of Fame for, for radio under almost just about every category. But basically, he's he's been in broad, gosh, he's been on the radio, I want to say almost, well, he started about 40 or 50 years ago, and he had a really unique show from the 90s up until like the mid you know, the 2000 teens, the Phil Hendry show. And I don't even know how to describe this show other than, uh, how would you describe it, Patrick? You were around him a lot. So, um, man, that is still a hard (laughs) thing to kind of put your finger on, but, uh, Phil's show was, um, I guess the way I would, I would describe it is that Phil Hendry had a talk radio show that had, some of the most outrageous and outlandish guests on his show. Right. For instance, uh, he might have somebody like from the Frank Sinatra fan club who would go around tasing anybody at a karaoke bar that would dare to sing My Way. <laughs> and then you would, you would hear this and you'd think, whoa, man, that's crazy. And then people would call in and they would, they would be very irate about this man and you know inevitably the man would get arrested and all this kinds of stuff and then you find out that um that phil is the guest and he's playing a joke on part of the audience and then the rest of the audience is in on the joke and that's so that's a a dynamic that's going on but more relevantly i think is this that he was and is actually incredibly quick-witted and he's a an improvisational genius i'd say right and oh yeah and then the, and the story would just build through the show and at first you think it's it's real and then you realize that it's it's just brilliant comedy so i know i went the long way but that was the only way I, I feel like it's it's fair to to describe it that way. Well, here, how's this, Patrick? Because I um, because I I mean, I think you're exactly right on the money. I can just tell you this: this is what this is what I um found as a listener. So I I just was flipping the channels. I should say in the so I discovered him in 2002. In 2002, I had four kids that were all pretty, you know, at at that age where. 
you know, I hate to say high maintenance, but they're, you know, they're younger kids. These are five and six and eight year old kids. And so whenever I had a break to help me sleep at night, I would just put the radio on and just sort of veg out for a while. And I was flipping the channel and I don't know why I stopped on this, but um, he was talking, I think he was talking to Bobby Dooley about doing, uh, and Bobby do, and, and it sounded like he's just a regular old talk radio host interviewing Bobby yeah. saying um, she was, you know, she's the head of the uh, Western Estates Homeowners As in, uh, Association, and she was just absolutely uh, vehement um, that she wanted to do a pre-dawn raid on, um, she wanted the police to do a pre-dawn raid on her neighbor's house because they had a blow-up pool in the front yard. And it was <laughs> a la Ely and Gonzalez. And it was like child abuse and everything. And nobody was laughing. He's like, now, Bobby, I'm on such and such. And then people would call in and they're cussing her out and they're they were furious. And I'm like, OK, immediately I knew this was a comedy show. What it, it, it took me a while before I realized that Phil was doing all the voices, though, because I'm like, OK, how is he talking into the phone so quickly? And how is he doing all these impersonations? And how is it that it almost sounds like he's talking on top of the other voice? It It's brilliant. I don't even know, I mean, how somebody does that. So Yeah, that's part of, you know, I, I, the way the doc works essentially is uh, with the use of chapters. And that is one of the chapters where he, because everybody says that, and and if you describe the show, you don't quite understand it until you hear it because he has perfected this very, very unique technique where he is able to to interrupt himself. Right. And as as Bill Hader says in his um, in his one of his um, segments, he says that you know he and the, his his partner over there at Barry they would just listen intently to try to figure out how he does it and that at times it almost seems as if he's talking at the same time as his own self it, and it, it, it yeah. really does create um a, sort of a something of a magic trick it, it is and and uh, it's I'm, i wanted to ask you about that coming up soon we, i want to ask you about some of the there's some really big names in entertainment that are just huge fans of uh, Phil Hendry's, but um, I did, I the thing is, there are so many things happening on the show at once, it really almost seems impossible, for one thing, that any networks would agree to put this show on the air, because I mean, for one thing, this is three hours, mostly improvised, I guess, and you, you know, you talk about playing with live ammunition, I mean, he's upsetting people, he's having to think on the fly with these premises, he's got a manage angry callers he's got a i mean it's it's insane all the things he's doing at once so uh i mean it's yeah an, uh, and we talk about that too where i mean honestly one of the the motivations for this was i just like what you're just describing right now is it just seems like how is th this doesn't fit in with the paradigm of radio well how is this i don't understand how this is working where you're where you're duping some of the audience, and I and I can't imagine that the people in that industry were getting it, you know. But <laughs> I and and what I learned was, in many ways, they weren't. And but Phil didn't have amazing ratings, but he had amazing engagement. Oh yeah. So for those who don't know, and I'm sure you do, there's there's a couple of ways that that. Um, things are quantified in radio and one is just straight up ratings you know how many people are, are listening and then the other is how long are they listening and for phil not surprisingly it was off the charts because every, you couldn't you know, tune it, out i mean you had to yeah, find out what was going to happen <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's just hilarious and then you would you would tune into his radio show like you would a, a tv show and listen to the end you know so I don't know. Is that what uh? Yeah. Is that what we were talking about? Exactly. I have to ask Patrick. Am <laughs> speaking of duping? How long were you not in on the joke? Oh, um, I think because I the first time I listened, I was um, I had kind of gone through a whole segment because I when I interviewed people, you know, sometimes people would only listen for whatever five minutes or something, and they would leave just lost. 
I think I was uh, I got turned on to him when I was taking long drives. So by the end, and for those who don't know, by the end of the the segments with the particular guest, it's pretty crazy. You know, they're like it's it's becoming unbelievable towards the end, and that's when. So I think I was okay. Like after the second one, I remember saying, like many listeners, I said to a friend of mine, "Man, this show I'm listening to is." is like crazy is this is a crazy show and they and they say oh that's phil man and they they told me and that seems to be the story with a lot of people that they relay the, what their experience was with a friend and then that person says that's phil hendry you got to keep listening it's amazing and by the way i mean the guy was insanely prolific and almost i mean they're not all you know knock out of the park but right it's close. Yeah, I, I, I'm a backstage pass member, so we've, Max, you've listened too. I mean, we've gone through it, and there's very few duds, I would call them. I mean, and yeah. Then, and then not only that, too, but the fact that not only is he a man of like um, uh, improv, but he's also an impersonator. And even Art Bell actually kind of <laughs> yeah. appreciated his imitations of him. But, yeah, tell us about the Art, the Art Bell segments, are the class, and he sounds just like him. I mean, and. Even down to the uh, what's the announcer with the the real deep voice that uh, he would do, and then the, having the dancing queen music playing as the bumper and everything. But uh, apparently, oh, Art no, Bell was a fan. So. Yeah, I didn't actually. I didn't include the the Art Bell stuff, and there was a bunch of things that I didn't include just because I had to sort of weave the story the way I had to weave it. I mean, there was by the way, there was some really interesting. I, I'd like to say that. You know, in my estimation, Phil Hendry is an artist, and he's not like a regular radio person. No. So that was my um, sort of guiding light or my north star while I while I made the thing. But that did preclude preclude me from doing, including some things that were really amazing and kind of out there. I don't know if it, if you'll find this interesting. Or it's not as funny as everything else, but I listened to one where he had Bobby Dooley on, and once again, for people who didn't know, Bobby Dooley is this this outrageous sort of middle-aged woman who doesn't, is, is inappropriate, and she has, you know, she's very, very opinionated, and she's extremely annoying, but yeah. in, in a hilarious way. But I, I don't know if you ever mm-hmm. heard this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. exactly. I've heard of Bobby you know, Dooley. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> constantly does that. But did you ever hear the one where her son, she has a couple of kids, and her son, Dylan, is, dies. And oh, he, sp- he spent the whole, he spent a whole segment speaking to Bobby Dooley, who is, you know, himself, yeah. um, about the death of her son, and there's not one joke in it. Right. I mean, that, that I don't, for me, anyway. Wait, was it a joke? Was, did, did, did he say at the end, or did she say, I'm just kidding? Because all his no, characters did. It was, oh, really? He died. I mean, the kid died, and then he just, he took this comedy show that he has, this extremely, you know, successful, you know, and just, and just went the whole time just consoling her. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that almost kind of makes me think of like the comedic shift from like Mash, where it's like, oh, that's that's a comedy. Oh, wait, this can get serious on yeah, a dime. Was, you don't know when or it. Or it's Andy Kaufman, you know. Right. Like, sometimes he just said, you know, no, I'm not going there. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to do jokes tonight. Right. Now he didn't do that very, you know, as far as I know, that was the only time he ever did it. But that was, I, I, I say that story only to say that he was, he served, you know, his his art regardless of of other you know pressures or demands that might have been upon him and i always respected that well i was wondering okay there's an episode because i recently discovered this one and i'm just like you you talked about engagement and you're right you don't just listen to two minutes of a phil hendry segment you have to hear the entire thing because you don't know how it's going to unfold. You don't know what's going to happen. But uh, there was one where he got on the air and he was just, he was there was no jokes. He was as serious as he could be. He said, you know, the um, my, the show has certain um, requirements. The uh, studio, the uh, the you know uh, was David Hall, like because David Hall was actually a real guy, I guess that he worked for. But he he's was like, the, he's in my film. Yeah, he was supposed to uh, provide this. He's going on for about five minutes about why he's 
unsatisfied with the with the situation of where he's working. He said, and so this is going to be my last broadcast. I am leaving the air. Good night. And then wow. um, he was getting ready to walk off, and he goes, "Okay, <clears throat> all right." The door's shut, and uh, the door was stuck, and it turned into this long gag where he was trying to make this big dramatic exit from the show. And you're like, "Is he really quitting?" But then, within 20 minutes, there's like, you know, Bud has get a got a chainsaw at the door, and they're trying. <laughs> and he was really embarrassed because he couldn't make this big, exciting, you know, walk off the show moment and everything. And I'm like, this guy is just a genius. And plus, taking risk that is some of the riskiest stuff I've ever heard of. Because I mean, you have to keep advertisers happy. You got to keep your your network happy, your sponsors. I mean, it. I don't know. I, I, in the well, trailer, it says juggling chainsaws. They're not kidding. That's what he did. So, Yeah, and, and you know, another interesting thing about all of that is that, you know, Phil was a guy that wanted to, like, like all of us, he wanted to succeed. And in the world of radio, as you know, succeeding means syndication. Right. And But interestingly, that show because it was so peculiar, you know, it did get syndicated, but it didn't really work all that great in syndication because now you're dealing with, you know, getting everybody up to speed and having the, all these different markets with all these different program directors and stuff trying to understand it and, you know, maybe get behind it and maybe some didn't. Right. And what ended up happening in, in that situation is, is Phil was sort of, um, you know, disappointed with how how this trajectory was going because it was supposed to be, you know, a house on the hill and, you know, everything is, is awesome. And then it ended up being sort of something of an artistic disappointment for him. And... Uh, and that's that's also part of the, part of the story. It's it's interesting too because when you look at history, you know, I, I the perfect example for me is the movie It's a Wonderful Life because apparently that was not a big box office success. Uh, yeah. It actually polarized some people. Some people had no interest in it at all, and it grows to become a classic. So you can't always even the the Charlie Brown Christmas is another one. The networks didn't even want to put that one out because they're like this thing's cheaply drawn it's jittery why are we using kid actors all this other stuff and yet it's a classic so the experts aren't always the you know the experts it seems to me well and certainly that is another element of this this film is that of all places for somebody to have their their artistic um talents um radio did not foster a person like Phil Hendry. Not at all. Yep. I and, have to. and it was just strange to, that was one of the things that I always found fascinating was that it was just, it was so fascinating to me to watch somebody truly stick to their artistic guns in a place where he was, I don't want to say he was unwanted, but, but uh, kind of. No, I, I think that's a right. That, that's a correct word. So, I, and yeah. another thing that kind of comes to mind with regards to the versatility of Phil Hendry in his career, like how you said that he radio couldn't necessarily sustain him. What intrigues me about him is the fact that he could even sustain himself in the realm of voice acting. For example, I remember hearing his work on shows such as Futurama, and he's still doing his shtick technically because he's playing two different characters at once in two different genders. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. So, yeah. Well, he does a lot of voice acting. I know that. So, hey, I wanted to ask you something. That, or not. I wanted to just let you and please let Phil know as well. There is one thing about Phil Hendry that even, you know, so we, we've we been doing Geek Tank um, close to 10 years out here. Uh, Max and I have always been in, interested in radio. And um, but um, one thing that struck me about Phil Hendry was the whole um, ever since the beginning, he was doing this backstage pass thing where you archive the shows and you can join the website and listen back to the shows, you know, way a, a big precursor to modern podcasting. And what struck me about his work is that it ages really well. It's not like, some, you know, there's some shows where they're talking about the news of the day, which I guess is great, but by a week later, you don't even care about the content. So it influenced me in the way we approach Geek Tank Radio to try to make content that is, if somebody were to listen five years from now, 
uh, hopefully they find it interesting. Like you don't want it too dated. And a lot of that goes back to just me being a fan of Phil Hendry. So I tell you, man, I, it's funny you're saying that because that is something, I mean, first of all, of course, you know, this, this documentary is about his radio, uh, life rather right. than what came after that. Although I do touch on what came after it at the end, but you know, I, of course, I had to immerse myself in what you're talking about, that archive, which is vast. Yeah. And I was, you know, just swimming around in that. And, you know, I'm a fan of comedy, you know, besides all this, of course. And, and it's remarkable how, you know, you'll watch a, even a, a movie or, or you'll listen to a comedy bit that you always found hilarious. I have to say, man, Phil is incredibly... Um, timeless in in how that stuff works. I mean, it was really risque then, and it continues to be risque in many ways. And I don't, and honestly, I don't know what what makes something last and and stay relevant. Um, I'd have to sort of do a thesis on that. But whatever it is, he has definitely done it you know he you listen to this stuff or even i was on a podcast yesterday with him and and you know he's just doing his thing and it's it's still you know it's you know sometimes you listen to like henny youngman or whatever you know you listen to older and you go like okay that was probably funny you know at some point but (laughs) bill is just you know just as funny and modern and everything is is as he ever was it's it's fantastic i want to ask you because uh in a second of course we want to steer into getting more you know about the um about the uh, documentary but uh just to kind of bookend this for you because i'm giving you my perspective as a as a listener and so yeah. i discovered him in 2002 i can't remember when they pulled him off the air because you know i mean i hate to say it like you said some of these networks they they couldn't care less how funny he was it was like you know and so a- it was essentially 2006. Yeah, so it was about 2006. And, and keep in mind, I'm you know, in fairness, I was raising kids. I was busy, and that was my focus. But sure. um, I rediscovered Phil. I was really – I'm always about <laughs> six years behind when it comes to technology. I'll just tell you that. So I didn't have a smartphone until 2016. But when I did, I said, huh, I wonder if there's any – I wonder what Phil Hendry is doing these days. Like – and sure enough, I found that he still had the backstage pass going and he had the daily podcast. So I, I rediscovered him then. And um, but uh, the day I don't know how I really just don't know. You talked about prolific. He comes up with new shows, basically about five shows a week, maybe four. He'll run replays and stuff. But I don't know how you do that, man. The guy and I've heard him say that if he's not creating, he's I don't know, I guess there's something he can't handle it. He has to be doing what he's doing. Is that what you saw? Yeah, he's got crazy energy and he, all, but, uh, but I think, I don't think he said it in, in my, um, in my investigation into all this, but it was said that maybe at a certain point it got to be a lot, you know, mm-hmm. that he was, I mean, he was doing a three, three to four hour show, you know, five days a week, as you said, and just churning out stuff that, you know, it's not like talk, you know, uh, sports radio or something where you're just kind of like talking about the, the game and then just, you know, spouting off and spewing about what you think and stuff. I mean, it requires a lot of, you know, a certain amount of preparation and, and just a lot of, you know, brain work, man. It was, uh, I mean, when you think about some of the... You know, I should say some of these characters that he developed, he doesn't believe that they were necessarily social commentary, but I kind of do. Oh and, yeah. You know, he would he would just develop these characters that had depth, and you kind of you know they they were sort of exaggerated um, versions of people that we all know, and which to me sort of equals social commentary, and you know they with that it would really go into some incredible places, you know, some, sometimes spurred on by the callers or sometimes not. But, you know, you would, you would see these, these people that he would create and, and what they would do, and you couldn't sort of help but wonder, like, where, you know, where's he going to take this? And <laughs> that was, uh, 
you know, just made it all the more fascinating in my mind. You kind of bait the hook there, Patrick. You really got me curious. In your opinion, what would you say is your favorite character that Phil Henry has created? <laughs> well, I, I'm a, I'm a little. Uh, I pause. I mean, the the answer comes right into my head, but I I, I feel weird about saying it. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, my one's equally weird. <laughs> yeah, I want all of us it's, to voice our because I. Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Well, it's Herb Sewell without that. <laughs> that's my favorite, too. That's that's Max's favorite. I, I didn't think anybody, he was anybody's favorite. I mean, he's great, but Herb Sewell. The guy's uh, a man. criminal. He's a creep and a pervert. And great a, bites think alike. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I know. It's it's not something that I'm I'm readily happy to admit, but those, those bits, I mean, I have a whole long segment. Oh, man, I have a a whole segment in there about Herb Sewell because to me that encapsulates just the the nature of how you know where he'll go you know like that's that's a very difficult place for a comic to try and get laughs okay you know? go ahead Matt because that yeah he is not afraid to be irreverent with Herb Sewell one of my favorite Herb Sewell segments has to be when he's talking about how people who are in a hurricane crisis situation need to get a laugh <laughs> <laughs> well, I like when he put, he pushes his wife out of the car and, and he right. started bouncing down the down the road like a rubber ball. You know? Oh yeah, Max, that's go. You you, you have a favorite line out of oh, that. Oh, like, bit, oh, right? no one gives you a guidebook for parenting, and it wasn't me that did it. I was out of my mind when I did it. Yeah, yeah. What a he's like. Well, you know, the kids the, the kids have grown a little um, uh, distant for me, and you know, their mother passed away <laughs> at a uh, you know when they were young. You, then later in the gag, you find out. They pa she passed away because he shoved her out of the car with them in the back seat. It's like he is exactly. just as evil. But but now the best part of Herb Sewell has to be the <laughs> his little his little goofy laugh. Is that is that based on Orson Welles or who who was that? Uh, it's William F. Buckley. Okay. And uh, and someone else who I uh, I can't remember and I didn't think I know. But uh, in the movie, it's so great, man, because. Bill Hader, who, by the way, that's also one of his favorites. you got to be characters. kidding me. And I had no idea doing, it was that popular. Yeah. He's doing Herb Sewell. I got him going. You know, I would cut between Hader doing Herb Sewell, Herb Sewell on the radio, and then Phil doing Herb Sewell, like, live on the, you know, in, in the interview. Yeah. And it's one of my favorite spots because everybody's just doing Herb, and and uh, it's to me, it's just it's just so funny man i think uh it's just the guy is just so out there that i i can't not crack up i i can't believe this because max that was what he was waiting he was like and i i feel like sometimes max is almost embarrassed to admit that he's his favorite character it's not necessarily embarrassed to admit it's you gotta you gotta walk on eggshells because i know these days he's not as prevalent on some of his modern contents yeah yeah all right yeah. well here's my favorite no see now i have to be honest I almost feel like it's picking a favorite child because in a certain context, there's probably about eight of them that are my favorite. But if I if somebody holds, holds a gun to my head, I have to say Steve Bozell might be my favorite. Mm. Um, and where he's always on the verge, of he's a big, tough, you know, manly <laughs> okay. guy, but he always sounds like he's ready to break down and cry and, and he wants to sue everyone. And he, <laughs> he's, but I thought he told me that he was based on what is it, Dick Vermeil? Who was the coach of the uh, Eagles that he would break down and cry in the middle of like a you know Hall of Fame speech or, or or he's motivating the team? I think he said it was Dick Vermeil. Does that sound? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, he doesn't say that, and he he never told me that. So, uh. well, let's. Sh I got one more quick question because we do got to shift to the documentary. I I okay. We do you know Geek Tank Radio here, and uh, at any given time there could be two to three to four of us here talking. Well, you know, if I say something to you, you talk, and then I can catch my breath, and Max can talk or whatever. But I don't. I this is a, a fundamental question. I don't even know how Phil Hendry can breathe, or if he has to take breathe. Like I almost feel like he must do breathing exercises, like an opera singer or something, because. He is talking the entire time and he's cutting off, you know, one character is cutting off the other or something. How does, have you ever seen him like gasping for air or, uh, <laughs> I just wonder about that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I have seen him do it and, and that is actually another one of those chapters where he talks about it. Um, 
he yeah, he's not really gasping for air, but he has definitely given that element of his act a lot of attention because he is he he can cut himself off in places where only a person interrupting another person would do it, if that makes any sense. You oh, know? yeah. It's hard. So, I don't know. He cuts somebody off and then says, okay, and that was Steve Bozell. And so, you know, and, yeah. And then there's also. Yeah, the- it's always like it's mid sentence and, and it's, and sometimes it's like right in a passionate place where, where right. all of a sudden two people are both passionate and they're cutting each other off. And there's just no way when you hear people speak that way. In, in this case, it's one person. But when you hear that, it's it's more than one person. You're not at all doubting that it's it's more than one person. So that's what's so incredibly effective about the show, and and it, and it really fuel. You know, it's really at the foundation of everything. And when I've seen video of him doing it, what kind of lends authenticity to the gambit is when he kind of had puts his fi- face at like different parts of, uh, like away from the microphone like he might right. be far away to sound like the general and like his chin's up or whatever or bud yeah. like he's like to the right of the mic or whatever it's like that level of that's just like a whole level of professionalism right there yeah well, it yeah, looks exhausting to thought, do the show i mean he's oh, moving oh around God. constantly it, yeah. it had to be exhausting and uh what's also kind of interesting about that is a lot of people assume that he had a device of some kind, you know, that a some, modulator or something. Yeah. yeah. Or some button that he could press or something that he, you know, tr- tried to figure out, but it's really just a guy with an old phone. I mean, that's it. Well, I wondered about that. And, and, and I wonder if he has, if he has like a supply of old phones, cause that's literally what he's <laughs> doing. He's got, uh, he's got the handheld thing fed into the board. At least that's what it looks like from the YouTube videos. And, uh, yeah, which they don't make anymore, I don't think. So, and he's got to have it scratching just the right way. And I don't know, man. It's it's, and it's funny because the YouTube videos, even, I, I don't know. You talk about theater of the mind. This is the ultimate theater of the mind. What what he did, what he does, and uh, so he, I don't know. But okay, so let's. So Patrick, how did this project come to be? And it's just called Hendry, right? H e n d r i e. For yeah, years, I called him Phil Henry. Henry. I, I mispronounced yeah, it. Yeah, I know. I used to, when I first started listening, I thought it was Henry. Yeah. But uh, I will say, uh, if I can just kind of go back to what you just oh, said. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I totally agree with you that it is the ultimate theater of the mind. It's like, it's in many ways, it's sort of like watching a movie inside your head. And that's, and for that reason, and I have to say, man, you know, since we're moving towards the, the doc, um, I I wanted to do a documentary on Phil Hendry even before I knew how to make a documentary. <laughs> and so years and years went by, and, uh, and then I ended up finding somebody that um, knew more people than I knew and could get me access to some of these people that, that I know that Phil uh, influenced and stuff. But um, I, I couldn't... So once I was up and rolling, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this documentary. It's just happening. I suddenly realized, like, whoa, how am I going to – this is an audio medium. And right. <laughs> last time I checked, you know, documentaries are visual. So I, don't, I had no thought about that. I didn't think, well, how am I so, – so then, you know, what, what can you do with that? So it took me – I mean, maybe this is embarrassing, but it took me months – to try and figure out how to serve Phil's comedy because I think the mistake that some documentarians make or filmmakers make is um, they compete with their subject. You know, and, mm. in, in this case, what am I going to, I'm going to try to accompany Phil's bits with visual things that I think are funny. Am I going to, am I going to animate, you know, people that are, act that look like what I think Bobby Dooley looks like. Or, right. You know, I didn't want to do that strictly based on what you just said, which is this lovely theater of the mind that this man has created, you know. So I ended up, uh, I used like, I don't know if you know who Don Hertzfeld is, but he's this great animator guy that, that actually uses stick men in this beautiful way. Oh, I think and, I've seen his work, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, so it's great. So I, I chose that. I, I chose Stick Man, a uh, Stick Man who I called Arvin, and he he's listening to Phil. So whenever the bits come on, Arvin is you know doing dishes or he's at the beach or something like that, and then the bits still remain theater of the mind. I'm I'm really glad you approach it that way because one thing I will say that I've never been a fan of is, uh, um, I. I like for example, my Bobby Dooley and my Steve Bozell are going to look yeah. different than Max's or your Steve. Bo- and yes. I don't want anybody to influence that. I don't want somebody. Oh, I I didn't think she had red hair, or I didn't. Th- you know, I just want that's that's my Bobby Dooley right there. So I know. I think Bobby Dooley's kind of sexy, but maybe not everybody thinks that. See, she, her attitude makes her not that she way, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think like she's physically attractive. Right. Mechanically, you could say she, yeah. So, but, um, but her personality rubs you the wrong way. But, well, so, so you came up with this, uh, and and I gotta be honest. Let's be, let's just. You said, you know, Phil Hendry went off the air in two thousand six. Seems like you're about fifteen years too late on this one. But, uh, what made you do this well, now? I mean, I know he's still working. I, I'm just, I'm trying to be uh, provocative here. But it's like, yeah, yeah, what took so long? Well. I mean, as we said earlier in this conversation, you may be right that it's 15 years too late, but if, if it didn't sort of stand the test of time, the material, I wouldn't have, but uh, it, it did. And it's, it's funny today. There's no doubt about it. Oh, it's, I listen every day. That's the first thing I listen to, you know. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I, and, I've said, what, what's, on the, what's on this morning's podcast? So, yep. Yeah, so, I mean... Well, the the story with that is I, I used to listen I used to drive here in California I was um, I was a, a student at an art school and then I used to come down to L A so I would I would listen to it all the time and I remember thinking like oh man you know somebody should do a documentary on this guy and then then he ended up going off the air and I, I like you I lost track of him and I, but I've always thought about him and uh, you know and I uh, a friend of mine, I think, had some tapes of his, and mm-hmm. you know, he was. I you know, found him on the internet some places, so I could still get my kind of fix a little bit. And then, um, and it just always stayed in my mind this idea. And then once he became less um, around or you know visible, I I thought, well, maybe this is even better. You know, this this telling people about this guy that was around and kind of you know influenced people i mean everybody was into him man like gary shandling was a fan of his you know judd apatow you know all, all kinds of bill murray comments. gary oldman i mean yeah, a bill lot murray, of heavy that's hitters right. yeah that's right and uh so i was like man you know this would be kind of cool to just say to everybody you know there was this guy who had made this amazing stuff and he kind of came and went and uh not that he's gone you know he's still doing great stuff but uh you know in terms of just a big radio um personality howard stern is another you know fan of his right and um and then i i met this who's a great friend of mine his his name is jordan brady he's a um he was a stand-up comic back in the day and uh, he worked alongside um judd and and uh wayne fetterman and, and these kind of guys and um and I had pitched it to him a couple of times, and he kind of just like didn't really listen. And then this last time, I said, look, man, I really think this would be an interesting idea. And, and this time he was listening, and so he helped me get access to some of these people. And, and honestly, man, once we, we started to go down the road, people really wanted to, like Henry Rollins was, I mean, I don't know if everybody knows who Henry Rollins oh, is, yeah. but Henry Rollins is, you know, a a punk icon and and like you know sort of a shaman to a lot of people and he i mean this guy loves phil like he didn't want to leave the interview room you know he right. was just he just wanted to talk more and more about phil i i so, got the impression that that's what is going to happen in in this documentary because i i feel like there's people just like us where it's like they can't wait to talk about him and they they want to share their experience with it so yeah and it's so interesting, man, like, you, as you say, your experience with it. He's the only radio person that I know about where you can remember the first time you heard him. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, like, or, yeah, exactly. You know, there's a, listening to him is, you have, you actually have experiences, which is not normal 
in the world of radio. Yeah. And it's more disposable, you know. And speaking from the perspective of someone who was introduced to him after the fact, I feel like your documentary documentary also kind of serves to, quote unquote, re-educate a new generation to kind of rediscover the genius that is his work. Oh, yeah. You're going to reach a lot, so. of young, lot, lot of young fans now. I hope so. Um, I hope so, man. And, you know, as I said, I tried to keep it, uh, his, his comedy, I tried to serve his comedy. And, and, you know, and the idea behind this one, man, is that he's, you know, this film isn't necessarily a documentary about Phil, although it is, but it's also a comedy in itself, you know, using Phil's material, you know. So I tried to, in terms of the cuts and stuff like that, I tried to always... You know, because it's not easy to, to, to take something that is, you know, usually his bits were like 15 minutes long. Right. And then try to, like, get him, you know, into this format. But uh, I did my best to, to, to keep it funny. And I think to watch it is, you know, you laugh, you know, and that's, that's what I was hoping to do. And I, that's what I, I hope people will do. Well, uh, and without too many spoilers um yeah. you t- I, i'm amazed that there's a segment on herb sewell that's that's hilarious so what what are we i mean i see the celebrity interviews i'm sure we're going to be hearing from phil are you going to show us his studio or are you going to show us like what what it looks like when he's doing the show and yeah i got some of that in there um yeah i mean there's a the what, the idea i had right away was to although i have i've interviewed him in a in a few different environments, but the the crux of it is uh, I rented a 1976 uh, Eldorado convertible, and uh, it just seeing Phil in that car is just perfect in my mind, you know. And he talks while we drive around his neighborhood, and that's that's sort of what's the vein that kind of moves throughout the whole thing. And uh, but it does go to where he's actually doing it in the in the studio. We do some of that, and then a lot of talking heads, and and then these animations that um, where this character kind of listen. He he listens to Phil, sort of in a deadpan way. Right. So we don't. It doesn't really trigger where you're supposed to laugh or anything like that. Um. And it's March fifteenth is the is the release. So what services uh, is it on? Because when uh, people are listening to this, uh, Patrick, let's just pull the curtain back. It's going to be after March fifteenth. So where can they watch this as soon as they uh, turn off the show here? Um, everywhere, I guess. Like it's on uh, streaming platform. I, so yeah, all of them. Yeah, the it's um, iTunes or well, I guess they call it Apple Apple TV now. I guess um, Prime. Um, all, all, I think any platform where you get that kind of stuff, it's, it's available. It's distributed by this company called Freestyle. They've been really cool and they're, they're, uh, they're out there promoting it. So I can't wait, I can man. You, I can read you the thing or, or maybe I'll just send it to you. Yeah. Send me that. We can link it up with our, uh, when we post this uh, episode and everything. So, um, yeah. Man, Patrick, this is so cool. I never thought I'd see the day that we'd get a, 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 you know, the comprehensive documentary about Phil Hendry. So, I mean, this is cool. And yeah, I, man, yeah. I have to say, you know, like now that it's it's done and out and stuff, that reaction is kind of common, you know. And I'm really, it really kind of warms my heart. Not for me, but just that that people are are so, you know, happy that that Phil is being recognized and that certainly, you know, kind of warms my heart, you know, I guess the thing is he came along at the perfect time. Cause now that I'm thinking of it, um, uh, you know, I told you, I didn't have a smartphone till 2016. I, part of me kind of liked the world better before smartphones were around. If I'm, if I'm being honest, uh, and because the thing is Phil Hendry, in my opinion, he stands alone. And yet in the podcast sphere, He's one of probably five million other podcasts. So to find him takes some effort. And I mean, he'd he'd still be the biggest uh, audio show out there, in my opinion, uh, if we didn't have th- this delivery method where there's so much other, you know, noise out there, you could say. So, yeah, I don't know. although he he seems to be doing really well, you know, with between the podcast 
and the and the website you know that has all the archives and stuff um i think he's doing good man and he he also is and you know this is in the movie too is you know doing lots of stuff on camera and oh, yeah. he's he's actually you know he's a great actor and you know he's uh anything that requires improvisation and stuff he gets gigs like that and he still does voiceover work and i mean phil is is definitely as relevant as he as he ever was and he's still busy and you know doing his thing it's great and would you say that based on well, my, your research of him that he would would he ever name quote unquote a successor like someone who could match his talent or what his ability or do you think that his talent is best to die with him <laughs> yeah i mean that's, that's morbid max but you're right yeah i don't know well i mean i i, I can't speak for him, but i but i can definitely speculate uh, i would say you know that it, it's it's he's just a singular kind of a guy like i i talked to uh you know that was one of the questions that i asked a lot of the the um the interviewees is you know isn't it fascinating that in many other places, you know, people, you know, like music, for instance, you know, you you do a certain thing and then people emulate you and then you become an influence because people have emulated what you've done or, you, or you've, you've influenced these people. And, and with him, it's, you know, very, very much respected, but nobody has sort of attempted it and and ever done anything i mean there's i guess there's some things uh, there, i guess there's a guy on tv that does something kind of similar in, in a talk show format i forget his name um but for the most part he has done something that nobody has tried to do again yeah that's what's interesting that's kind of amazing yeah, it, that, I, I've thought the same thing. I'm like, huh, why isn't some voice actor? I know like uh, Jess Harnell, we, we, we got to meet him uh, once through our convention, and the guy can imperson literally can impersonate ever, anybody. He got sued by Steve Perry for sounding too much like Steve Perry, you know, that type wow. of thing. But I still think there is something singular about Phil Hendry. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not sure even Jess Harnell could do something like that. So, I mean, it's it's the right attitude. It's the right sensibilities. It's the the way he unfolds a, a story. He does, you know, it, it, it keeps you, you know, wanting more, but it also makes you, you, you ha you're compelled to listen to every minute of the show. So it's yeah, a kind of genius if... that I don't know who else has that, so. Yeah, and I'm always I'm always a little weird about using the genius word, but if if it is to be used in in the case of Phil, it would have to be, and and to to your point, it would have to be that he was really really funny on the mo uh, at the highest percentage. You know, in other words, if somebody were to try to say, "Oh, let me try to do this Phil Hendry shtick." I don't know if they could, you know, no. like it's just, it's happening so quickly and the stuff that he is coming up with on the fly at the speed that it's, you know, going on, I, I don't, I don't know if there's that many people that could, you know, physically pull it off. No, no. The guy, the guy stands alone, man. And Patrick, I'm so glad you, uh, I'm so glad you made this movie. I, I can't wait to watch this. And um, will you please tell Phil, we, you know, here in Memphis, we, we just love the guy, um, and keep going strong. And, and I, like I said, I'm a backstage pass member. I listen every day, man. But, oh uh, man, I can't wait to tell him. I'm going to see him tomorrow. We're, uh, he's doing like a, a channel two news thing to promote it, which we're we're excited about. And uh, I'll be. I'll be sure to tell him about this conversation and about you guys. And uh, I think it's it's awesome that you're into it, and I'm, I'm so glad people are. Yeah, absolutely, man. We well, we and fun little thing. We interviewed Mo Collins here uh, last year, and I know she's a big friend of his. So you know, uh, uh, she has she loves Phil Hendry too. She we we wound up talking about him in her interview, which was kind of interesting. But uh, hey. So it's Hendry, H-E-N-D-R-I-E. I always spell it because it's Thank easy you. to sound like Hendry. Uh, March 15th, everywhere on streaming. And um, uh, Patrick, how do people follow you on social media? Because I have to say, I really appreciate that you interact with your fans pretty pretty well, you know. Yeah, I mean, my my social media thing is, is pretty uh, meager. But my Instagram 
is Pitrack, P-I-T-R-A-C-K. That was my childhood nickname, Eleven. And, uh, well, no wonder you know. nobody can find you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I got this thing. Like, people were like, you should get on Instagram. I'm like, what is this? What's Instagram? Jeez, but okay. uh, I, it's what it is now, and I, I'm stuck with it, so that's what's happening. All right. Well, good luck with that, man. Okay, so <laughs> Pit Rack on Instagram, folks. There you have it. I, I found Pit you Rack. on Facebook much easier. So oh, um, Okay. All right. Well, hey, Patrick, this is great, man. Wish you all the success in the world. And I, and I can please consider yourself a friend of the show. I hope we can uh, talk to you again, man. Yeah, man. I mean, please tell me what you think of it uh, when you see it. And um, and I, I can't thank you enough for having me on. And thanks for the uh, all the all the time. You're really generous with the time. And I can't believe you and Max are both the sickos who uh, Herb Sewell is your. OK, anyway. All right, Max. <laughs> You got a fellow uh, a comrade in that one. So, Patrick, we're going to let you go, man. But uh, thanks again. And it was great talking to you here on Geek Tank Radio. Thank you so much. You are listening to Geek Tank Radio on 98.1 The Max. The Geek Patrol is back. That's where I saw the leprechaun. Right, a leprechaun. He told me to burn things. <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hey, man. Very good. Wow, Max finally is on task and as a as an appropriate rejoiner. Well done, Max. That, you might, your, your career, you've reached the pinnacle, my friend. <laughs> well, it told me to burn things. Exactly. And welcome back to uh, Geek Tank Radio, everybody. I'm Joe Thorderson here with my friends Brandon Olmstead and Alan Gilbert <sighs> and our buddy Max over there behind the glass. And uh, sitting in the studio, uh, we've got our friends... Uh, Allie Diggs, and my daughter, Michaela Thornton. Mm. She is an up-and-coming uh, filmmaker. She's uh, an aspiring, uh, you know, she's, she just opened her own production company, low-budget uh, film production. So, uh, Alan, I'm going to tell you this, in a, in a, in, I'm really appreciative because, you know, we have a short visit coming up at Small Chin, and uh, Max is going to be dialing in just a minute to go get him on the phone. Um, but you, 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 you're going to surrender your questions to let Michaela have a shot. Absolutely. So thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And I know uh, Allie cannot wait for this. Yeah. Don't worry, Alan. I, I got something for us. You got me. Comes, I got, you got you. me, bro. I got you. Yeah. So Joe may so, hate me for it, but I got you. We, we can't wait. So Max, do we have them on the line now? We do. All right, you guys, we got our buddy Dave Dasmalchin on the phone. Dave Dat. Uh, I always mispronounce his name. Dave Dasmalchin. Hey, David, you how's it going, it. my you friend? You got it. It's great. How are you guys? It's great to talk to you. My good friends, I miss you. I am very happy to be here chatting about uh, all things geek. Well, hey, we really wanted to ask you about Late Night with the Devil because I got I I'm not even a horror fan, David, and I'm stoked for this movie and uh we we uh we want to know more. What can you tell us without too many spoilers? Well, most important, well, most important thing about this film, whether you're a horror person or not, if you love a great, fun ride of a movie, uh, I promise you, you will have a good time coming to see this. Yes, it is. It falls into the genre of horror, but this is a movie that takes place on Halloween night, 1977. A guy named Jack Delroy had basically the second ranked late night talk show for late night television at that time and was getting clobbered uh, by Johnny Carson, and he was so desperate to save his show because he was about to get canceled that one night, Halloween night, he decided he was going to try and shock all of his viewers and really boost his ratings. And what he did uh, led to a series of events that as you watch the film and you see unfold, things get out of control. But to me, this movie reminds me of uh, some of my favorite stuff that I saw there to really love film. It, it has an energy and uh, kind of wildness that something like network would have. And it's got obviously like the dramatic horror elements, like a Rosemary's baby, but it's also, um, it's just really fun. It's a fun movie. And I, and I, I, I really hope everyone will give it a shot and take a chance and go see it. Scary and fun. There you go. Yeah, I, I, for one, am very excited to see it. Um, I had a question for you. When I was watching the trailer, I was terrified. Um, <laughs> and I was wondering, did you ever have any times, like, leaving set and going home, did you struggle to disconnect from, like, the heaviness and the darkness on the set? Or was it easy for you to just, like, go and do your job and then, like, sort of clock you out? You know, and get home? I... 
I, I've, I've always been um, made, worked very, very diligently as an actor to hone my skills technically so that I don't have to rely upon emotional states of being, but rather using my my facial muscles, my vocal muscles, my body, um, my, you know, uh, acting tools so that I can mimic and manufacture emotional states of being um, over and over and over again. Let's say, uh, you know, you have to do a take 30 times where you're supposed to go from happy to crying. And so if I'm actually feeling so sad that I'm physically crying, to me, that can, it doesn't always work. So I do try to really approach the work in a very technical way. But, but the thing that was the wildest to me, I had like three incidents on the set of filming this movie that scared the living crud out of me. One was I was walking down a long hallway by myself. It was pretty dark in the middle of a long day of shooting. And I happened to go past the door of, um, the one of the stars of the film, uh, Ingrid Torelli, who plays Lily, who mm -hmm. plays a girl who claims to have an uh, entity inside of her. And as I was walking past her door, she was staring in the mirror at herself, <laughs> just preparing for the role. And she had this look on, in her eye and her face was all twisted, all weird. <laughs> and it scared the poop yeah. out of me. The other time was at one point... Um, a table started shaking. I mean, it was a special effect. It was meant to shake, yeah. but it felt like it was shaking when the machinery would stop or before after. And it was, it was super creepy. And, and then uh, the last time was um, during one of the uh, interviews, which you'll see in the film, because it's a talk show host. So he's doing these interviews. And um, I just got the chills really bad at one point, got really, really scared. So that was, that was the most that it that it stuck with me for sure. It was one of the hardest roles I've ever done, but wow, also yeah. one of the most gratifying by far. Very cool. Yeah, Yay. David, just kind of playing off of uh, Ali's question over there. I was over there. I was watching a interview you did with the Hollywood Reporter actually just about a year ago before filming the scene. Reflecting back, like in that interview, you said you had a lot of worry about taking on this role of a you know, am I able to do this? Am I able to be this character? Um, just looking back a year now after everything's happened, how does it, how, has any of that worried like diminished or at all? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, I got to see the film last year. At, so we filmed this movie two years ago and then last year it premiered at South by Southwest. And since then it's played a number of really wonderful festivals, Sitkiss and Fantasia or Fantastic Fest and, um, played at uh, Overlook, many, many more, Chicago International Film Fest. So getting to see it with different audiences was very rewarding. The thing that was so scary for me was when we were starting filming and the idea of trying to, you know, capture the energy, the charisma, the spirit of what it would uh, even second place talk show host, you know, is, is a lot. Because talk show hosts are not just guys reading lines. They are you know, comedians, they're improvisers, they're uh, really good um, at, 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 you know, engaging in question and answer with, with, with their guests. It's like, it's a whole other skill set. And to do it convincingly to me was very scary because I knew if, if people were watching this movie and they felt like they were just watching an actor pretending, they were going to check out pretty quickly. So I, I watched hundreds of hours of old Johnny Carson and David Letterman, and Don Lane and other, you know, late night hosts. And I got as much of the syncopation and rhythm and timing as I could possibly try to, to mimic. And um, so now sitting here today, of course, I'm nervous. The movie's about to come out. I hope people like it. I hope people go see it. That's the fear that you always have. But, um, but no, I feel really great to have, but um but no, I feel really great about the work, and I think I definitely learned a ton about myself as an actor. Awesome. Okay, David, I just want to switch gears for just a second. Uh, me and Alan were talking before we got you on the phone, and we realized we still owe you a barbecue tour, so we want to know what we need to do to get you back to Memphis and win. <laughs> uh Hey man, I, you you when you dangle that carrot, it's like <laughs> as soon as possible. I uh, I you know obviously my 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 life and my schedule have just continued to get busier and busier since the last time I saw you guys. But I, um, 
I still, uh, you know, love my magic wands that I got, uh, nice. my beautifully carved wooden wands, my Harry Potter wands, and my baseball bat. And uh, I think fondly, and I know that you guys do believe you can outdo my Kansas City barbecue, so I'm willing to give it a shot. Bring um, it on. Yeah. <laughs> I you know we can. Happen, hey, uh, all right. Hey, David. Yeah, we. Well, we'll talk. Off. Hey, hey. Um, um, it's convention season. Hey, uh, but David, you guys. Okay, th- I'm seeing 100 percent scores on Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm seeing Stephen King saying, "You, I can't take my eyes off it." I think you guys have hit into something pretty big, and I don't. Like I said, I can't. I don't really even have a, much of a stomach for horror, but I can't wait to see this movie. It's not just because you're in it. It looks really different, and I want. I want something different in my in my movies these days. Thanks, man. I, I think you're going to really, I have a good feeling that you're going to respond to it. And like I said, if, you, if people are out there afraid to see this movie because they don't necessarily like horror, I would say give it a shot because it does fall into a space that is it, it's, it's highly entertaining. There is actually a really great amount of comedy, not from me, but there is some actors in this who are so good. There's this guy, Reese, who plays my sidekick on the show. He's basically my Ed McMahon, you know, my Andy mm-hmm. Richter. Um, he's so great. And you know what's wild? He's never been in a film before. He's never even done te- television theater. He's an improv guy who the directors, there's two directors, uh, they're brothers, Colin and Cameron. They write and direct together all their movies. It's a really wonderful family kind of operation they've got just like you guys are doing. And uh, Colin and Cameron uh, found him watching a, like a comedy sports improv show one night, and they said, this guy's got to be in our movie. And, and, now, and they got him. He plays Gus, and he steals the show. He's so, so great. Gus, okay. Uh, which, well, never mind. Hey, David, you sold me when you trotted. There's one trailer where you trot out, and I'm like, that looks very 70s to me. Just your mannerisms. You got the... You got the cheesy suit and everything, man. I think whatever filter you guys are using, whatever c- cinematography, I mean, it looks like, it looks out of the seventies. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's really great. They got a production designer who used to design game shows, used to design game show sets back in the nineteen seventies, uh, and he did such a killer job building those sets and making them look authentic. And then the camera team. You know, it's it's everything. You got three cameras going almost all the time, the way that they would on a live television broadcast. You've got um, some of the cameramen were actually operating those big old tube camera uh, robot looking things that you used to see on TV sets. So they put like I think we were shooting on reds. I believe they put one you know in there, and then uh, the ability to allow things like mics boom mics to go into frame to allow little things that you would see if you were watching a a tv show in the 70s it just gives it this flavor this feel of authenticity that is i think it's it's really fun it's cool and uh hey i know we got you're doing a lot of press tonight so we gotta probably uh let you go but uh david i i will say for folks that might not be familiar might not be familiar with your comic book work i'm not saying that it's based on Count Crowley or anything, but I'd say Count Crowley and Late Night with the Devil definitely rhyme. They really feel like they're in your wheelhouse, man. They go hand in hand. Listen, go to your local comic shop. We got to go. If if you haven't bought a comic book in a long time, please, if you're listening, go to your local comic shop. I know these guys have their uh, go-to spots in in Memphis, and I want you guys to continue to support local brick-and-mortar shops. Go buy... Whatever. If you haven't bought a Superman comic since you were a kid, go check it out. Go see what what catches your eye on the shelf when it's new release Wednesdays. You can go and just just see what catches your eye. And if you are so inclined and you like something fun and scary, grab a copy of the new Count Crowley. We've got a whole new volume coming right now. And and I think then you get in your car and you go to the local the cinema and you see Late Night with the Devil. And boy, you're going to have one very out here um, grateful for you. We'll be, I got, uh, we have our copies right here in front of us, David. So we are promoting your art, my friend. But uh, I love it. We love I'm you, so brother. For you we, guys. we know we'll we gotta, love you guys. We got to let you go. But hey, David, really, man, hopefully we'll see you in Memphis in the near future. I would love to make that happen and, and let Memphis know to let me know uh, to give me shout outs on social media and say, come down here and, and it'll just keep reminding me. And I know when, the, when is, when is the, when is the next, uh, November, 
November 23rd, you know, so we'll right. talk, my so friend. That's like right after Thanksgiving or right before? Right, right before. before. Right before. Right so. before. Okay, cool, yeah. guys. That's great. All right, well, much love, uh, and thanks again for all the support, and uh, hey, you're always going to be a great geek to me. Great. Thanks, yeah. David. Thank talk you to you so soon, much. man. Bye.